Randy, can you take us to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9? Go ahead and open your Bibles there. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Take your time and walk us through the truths in this passage. Yes, this is a passage that we'll spend a, a good amount uh, of time on because it's one of the primary passages in all of Scripture on giving. And it says a number of surprising things. And I, I got to tell you that this is one of the most joyful, uh, thanksgiving-filled passages in all of Scripture. And it's a passage about giving. If there's one thing that comes across this weekend in this unusual type of conference that we're doing, where the services don't repeat themselves with the same content, but we're moving forward with something, if there's one thing that we'd want you to take home from all of the sessions, it would be that this, there is a place to talk about duty. There certainly is a place to talk about duty. I do not disparage duty at all. Think of our veterans who stood, mm -hmm. fulfilling their duty. Mm -hmm. But I'll bet there were lots of times of joy that went with fulfilling that duty. Yes, danger in some cases, and drudgery in other cases, but also a certain joy of serving but God calls us to experience a profound happiness in giving. And you see that from the very beginning all the way to the end of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And now, brothers, 2 Corinthians 8 1, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Starts right out by talking about the grace of God. So it starts with God's grace. The Greek word that is translated grace is the word charis. And, and it is a word which means giving. That's what it means. When God extends his grace to us, what's he doing? For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave. 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 That's what God's grace is. It's to give to us. Of course, the greatest gift he ever gave to us was Jesus Christ. And he's not a gift that's been taken away from us. If we know him, he not only went to the cross for us, he not only rose from the grave, he not only ascended to the right hand of God, but he actually indwells, and so does the Holy Spirit of God, those who have trusted him to forgive them of their sins. And by the way, it would always be wrong to presume that everybody listening already knows Jesus Christ. You could have been going to this church for years and actually not know Jesus. So we would just uh, invite you, if you haven't placed your faith in him, as we talk about the grace of God, we're not just talking about our giving. This, is a, this passage is saturated in the grace of God for us. Brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Now, he's writing to the believers in Corinth. They, if you look on a map, you'll see that Corinth was in southern Greece. And your map would probably say Achaia. Macedonia was northern Greece. And there was a, a big kind of rivalry, generally, between northern Greece, Macedonia, and southern Greece, Achaia. And what he's doing is, he's kind of playing on that rivalry. He's talking about, you know, the churches in Macedonia, out of the most severe trial. Now, just, just hang with this and try to wrap your mind around the paradoxical statement that this is. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy, and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. What? I mean, does that even make sense? And let me tell you, from a human point of view, it does not. From God's point of view, it does. God's point of view is the right one. And they got it. And if you've ever been around really poor people, and I've had that privilege and honor, some of you have had that more than I've had it, and a lot of us here have had that experience, but I mean 
And you see the grace of God at work in their lives, and you see them generously giving. It's, to, it's enough to take your breath away, and it's not just that they dutifully say, okay, we don't have much, but it's our duty, and so we'll be miserable as we do our duty. Oh, no. It is overflowing joy. They take you into their homes. They fix you what might mm -hmm. be a food that, mm -hmm. that would be a week's worth of food with yeah. their daily rations, and they put it in front of you, or it might be a month's worth. We've been at yeah. worth. We've been in situations right. like that. You have too. It's just, it's stunning how God moves in the hearts of uh, poor people, and when they give. It brings delight. And you can't rob them of that joy. Absolutely. Because they are so honored that you're in their home. Right. And it's like, come on. Can you, but but yeah. to say don't, to not do it would rob them of their joy. So true. And if you've ever been the visiting American that feels guilty yeah. when they put what costs them so much, such a high percentage of their very low income, and they do this in your honor. The tendency is to feel really guilty. Yeah. Especially if you don't like the food. <laughs> then you feel really, really guilty. And then other times you love the food. But the point is you could feel guilty. But, and then you could go, oh, no, 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 no. Don't do this. And, no, no. As yeah. Alan said, it's a privilege. And it goes actually right on to say that. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up, welled up in rich generosity. So, by the way, the richest generosity often is seen among the poor. It's not, because we could think logically, well, the more you have, the more you have to give, right? Therefore, the more generous you can be. No, because man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says. So God knows proportions. He knows not just how much we give, but how much we keep. He knows what proportionate giving is, and he knows, as in the case of the poor widow of Mark 12, she mm -hmm. gave everything. And God's heart was moved, and joy and, and was and brought that, to and God. And that portion with the widow, Jesus was watching people give. That's a little sobering in and of itself. Yes. And then this dear, sweet woman who had virtually nothing gave what little she had. Exactly. And he said, no, that one is the one I commend. Good. I'm so glad you said that because God, as he watched the poor widow give, he watches all of us in everything. He sees what we give and what we don't give. And if you ever think of who am I trying to please, Hope you're not trying to please other people with your giving. Jesus addressed that very directly too, and we'll get into it at some point. But hope that you just want to please God, and you want to help other people, and you want to see the look of pleasure in them, and that's what they wanted. Because they were taking a special offering for the saints in Jerusalem who had uh, undergone a great famine. Uh, and so in their extreme poverty, it, it wells up in, in, in rich generosity, their joy. For I testify, Paul says, that they gave, verse 3, as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. So how do you give beyond your ability? I mean, even giving as much as you're able. Wow, that's a lot. And then you go beyond that. I think it means you go beyond what's reasonable. You go beyond what makes sense from a human point of view. Every time Nancy and I have done that, and every time many of you have done that, if you look back with regret and say, oh, I just wish I would have kept it, you, know, you just you see the blessing and the trust in God. And that's what they were seeing. They gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, and then entirely on their own. Now listen to this, verse 4. Again, so counterintuitive. But look at this beautiful picture. These extremely poor people urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service, this giving to the people of God, to the saints. All right, now, when it says they urgently pleaded, what does that mean? Well, usually when you're pleading for something, it's why? Why are you pleading? 
It's because there's resistance to what you're asking. What would the resistance be in this case? It would be everybody saying, you're as poor, probably poorer than the people in Jerusalem. You shouldn't be giving. Keep it. No, no, no. They're begging not to be left out. They're begging for the privilege. This word that's translated privilege in the original language means privilege, which is why it's translated that way. That's why the team of Greek scholars said privilege. So really, this doesn't have some like special meaning. Think of the things in your life that you just consider a privilege. Giving should be really, really high on that list. If the poorest people, and if they were called people in extreme poverty in that place and time, wow, <laughs> the, the average person was poor by modern standards, certainly by Western standards, and they had extreme poverty. And so God says that in his inspired word here, they pleaded with the privilege for the, with us for the privilege of sharing the service and the saints. They did not do as we expected. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. In other words, it wasn't they wanted to give because we asked them to give or gave them the opportunity to give. No, no, it was between them and God. They went to God first to the Lord. It's all about God. He's the audience of one. He's the one who sees us. And listen, he's the one, like right now, if my main desire in this service, or Alan's main desire in this service, would be to please you right now, we would be missing the mark. It would be wrong. And it wouldn't be good for you. What we should be doing is wanting to please the audience of one. And if none of you were here, and he was sitting in that front row, and he is as present as if that were the case right now, I want to be able to look not just at Mark or Carol or Daryl or Christy or Nancy. I want to be able to look at Jesus and say, Lord, I'm saying this because I believe you would be pleased by it. Which means occasionally I will say something that I'll know for sure will displease many other people in the room. So it's not good to be people pleasers. So this is what they're saying. This is what you know, Paul is saying, that they looked first to the Lord. And then, we, and then he says, verse 6, We urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. He's referring to the offering. The offering taken for the saints in Jerusalem. The offering, the contribution to the saints is called an act of grace. When, the, when you go to the offering box or on those special occasions when we pass an offering plate, wouldn't it be great? I mean, do you think of it in terms of this giving I'm doing now is an act of grace? That'd be a great thing to even call it, an mm -hmm. act of grace. Mm -hmm. This is what God calls it. This act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in your love for us. And by the way, the church at Corinth was pretty proud of a number of things. You see that in the book of 1 Corinthians. And so they were proud of how they excelled in doing this and doing that. And they had great knowledge and they had spiritual gifts and they were very proud of those things. And he says, so as you want to excel, do the best. And you know, the desire for excellence is not, is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's like Eric Little you know, the great Olympic runner and the movie Chariots of Fire, this, this real guy, and, and when he says those words, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. He knows he's been wired to do this, and it will please God for him to do it, and he wants to excel in his running and it's a good thing to want to excel in your business and excel in your academics and excel your, your work and your life and your family and 
the things that are important. I want to be the best dad I can be. I want to be the best husband. I want to be the best mom, the best wife. If you're a single person, I want to be the best to all of these people in my life. You also should excel, he says, in this grace of giving. Whoa. So learn to excel at giving. What are my goals this next year? To improve in this area. New Year's resolutions. That's coming up. All right. But don't wait till then. And so here's my resolution. I want to do this. I want to excel. That's not a bad thing. I mean, it's a bad thing if it's just nominal and we're not really going to do it. But let's excel. And and God says, okay, I want you to excel in the grace of giving. Become a better giver. Become a better conveyor of my grace, which I have shown to you. And then he says, I'm not commanding you, but this is a special offering. This isn't mandatory giving. He says, I'm not commanding you. But I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. So I'm using other illustrations as as an example. I think it's good when we hear illustrations of other people who God's worked in their life to give, to pray, to study his word, to go on a mission trip, to serve on the mission field. Aren't you grateful we can hear those stories of people that that are doing it and and that motivates us to do more? And then he says, verse 9 because he's, remember, he's never stopped talking about grace, and now he just moves right to it. Verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, okay, now think about this. Has there been anyone in human history as rich as Jesus was before he came to this world? The ultimate wealth. To live in heaven as part of the triune God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to choose to leave that behind. Have you ever thought in your life, "Eh, this is tough to leave this behind. I love this house. I love this church. I love this neighborhood. I love this job. But I got to move on. You think you've left something behind? Think of what Jesus left behind. But he did it with a reason, and he did it with joy. In fact, Hebrews 12 says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the pain. The pain wasn't enjoyable. And is now seated at the right hand of God for the joy set before him. For the joy set before him, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor. No greater wealth in human history. No greater poverty in human history. And I'm not talking about the life that he lived. It was a very simple life. It was poor by most standards. But he had enough food to eat normally. But I'm talking about the poverty of hanging on the cross. And taking upon himself the sins of the whole world. And blackness coming on the face of the earth for three hours and crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And knowing the answer to that question, that that's what he and the Father and Holy Spirit planned from eternity past to pay the price for our sins. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that so that you through his poverty might become rich. God has made even the poorest people in this world who know him among the wealthiest people in human history. We are wealthy to have enjoyed the grace of God. And what he's saying in this passage is, take the grace that I have entrusted to you and share it with others. My grace is the lightning. Your giving is merely the thunder. Where's the thunder without the lightning? It literally is impossible. Oh, you could go through the motions. You could make some noise and pretend it's thunder. But the thunder of God's grace is such that it penetrates our hearts and it changes us. And when you know what Jesus has done for you, 
anything that you would give up for any other person in the name of Christ is so small. And think about the people who have said, have done these great sacrificial things. I mean, think about Jim Elliott and, and, and Nate Saint. And I know your son-in-law, Dave, was yeah. inspired by Nate Saint. That's and, why he's in MAF. Yeah, uh, to be a missionary pilot. And, and Jim Elliott and, and Nate Saint and those other guys that died on that mission field. And sometimes people quote Jim Elliott like they're quoting this great sacrificial missionary. And they say, Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Would you just analyze that great sacrificial statement? What's it about? Jim Elliott was thinking in all that he gave for these tribal people known then as the Aka people and Steve Saint and Minkaye from that tribe who came to Christ after he had killed several of the, mi of the missionaries. It was here at, at Good Shepherd years mm -hmm. ago. Um, what those people now called the Hurani people, what they experienced in their lives was the grace of God and what those missionary martyrs experienced was the joy. I don't mean the joy when they were murdered. I don't mean it was joyful for their families that husband, father was lost. But listen to what Jim Elliott actually said. He is no fool. Don't be a fool. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. Folks, look at this world around us. Look at everything you own. It's going to end up at the dump. Take a field trip to a dump and look around. That's where it's going to end up. But you're not going to end up in the dump. You're going to end up, if you know Jesus Christ, with him forever. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You can't keep your money. You can't keep your possessions. Or you can keep them for a short time. But ultimately, you're going to part with them. The question is, are you going to part with some of them? Maybe a significant amount of God so leads you. Before you have to. When it's still your choice to invest in God's kingdom. And I think what I'm going to do is do a couple more verses in okay. chapter 8 and then tomorrow okay. hit in chapter 9. Where he goes on to say in verse 10, last year you were the first not only to give but also to have the desire to do so. And verse 11, now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. What he's saying is, great that you have good intentions. Great that my heart, and all of us have been there, right? Where our heart's been moved, and maybe it's a missions weekend, and Jonathan or uh, Dr. Val or some guest speaker is, you know, challenging us in world missions. Maybe our hearts are moved, and we feel like, yeah, I have the desire. I really want to do it. I really want to give to the building project. I want to give to this. I want to be a giver. But then we sort of don't follow through. And he says, you have the desire to do so. Verse 11, now finish the work. Actually do it. Just do it. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. Good intentions, great but now follow up and actually complete it and do it. The gift is acceptable according to what one has. There's always going to be people that can give more than you. Okay, no problem. Give what you can. Give according to your ability. And maybe even look at the joy of the Macedonians who gave beyond their ability. And then he says... Uh, Doing this, that there might be equality, verse 14, at the present time your pl plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality as it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. In other words, God sovereignly looks at us and says, I'm going to give more to some of my children and less to others of them. And then the ones I'm going to give more to, 
I'm going to call upon them to give of the extra, the surplus that I've entrusted to them that they will help the others. And you know what? It's a great thing to be on both sides of that. Let me just uh, finish up with this story. Uh, our ministry, Eternal Perspective Ministries, has had the privilege over the years of giving away um, 100% of the royalties from my books, and, and God has abundantly provided for us over the years. But we've had a few times where God has humbled us and called us to our knees and, and to trust Him because we're falling short in funds in the world. The thing I hate to do probably more than anything else is to ever ask people for money, to share the need or whatever. And some of that maybe is okay and some of it's maybe just pride on my part that I just don't want to be the recipient because it's so fun being the giver. Uh, but then I do it and then I have people respond and they, and we see people respond. It's amazing. But there, there's a group called Action International. Some mm -hmm. of you are familiar with them. And over the years, by God's grace, we've been able to give a significant am amount from the royalties to this ministry. <clears throat> and then we had this shortfall, and I sent out this letter, and bending over backwards, to, this is not, not begging, I'm not, you know, just, but if God should so lead. And then we get a check for $500 from Action <laughs> International. Oh, man. Okay, so that is an example, and this has happened twice now. And moves my heart to tears because these are people who in the world of missions and ministries are more like the Macedonians. Let me just tell you, they're not having 30-minute infomercials about their ministry and support this and support that. And they, they just, they're just a modest ministry. But when they gave to us those two times, I thought, you know, God, you get, this is a time where they have the privilege of giving and you have the privilege of receiving. But both ends of that, giving and receiving, gets us into the grace of God, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving and receiving in the gospel. We know the Lord, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich, entrusted with that very grace, that we would have a taste of the joy that God has in giving as we give to others and for the sake of the kingdom of God.